Today I'm going to focus on um, the structural softwood market from an um, Australian sawmiller's perspective, and that sawmiller is, um, of course, AKD. Who's AKD? Um, we're the largest softwood sawmiller in Australia. Um, we have six facilities um, across the East Coast, Caboolture in Queensland, um, Tumut in New South Wales, Colac and Irrawarra in the Otways region of Victoria, Yarram in Victoria, and we also have um, a JV with boral timber at um, Oberon called Highland Pine. We've been in business since 1955. We're pretty proud of that family-owned business with, um, with its spiritual home in, in Colac. We're also, though, an integrated business with forestry, sawmilling and other value-add um, facilities. We employ about 1,200 people. Um, our share is about 20% of the structural market in Australia. So we're the biggest single supplier um, of the category. Um, I'd also just like to recognise here our customers. Um, of course, we've got a range of different customers from um, timber frame and truss fabricators, merchants, big boss, box customers, pallet and packaging manufacturers, other wholesalers, and of course, um, other industrial users of timber. AKD's approach to market, probably important to share this with everyone today um, in terms of, you know, we're, we are in stressful um, supply chain situations at the moment. Um, and so we find sticking to our principles and our values pretty important. Um, some key things about core customers um, and what we're looking for, consistency through cycles. Um, and also in alignment with our value. Um, what do we look to do as an essential supplier? Um, again, really relevant in the market today. Um, we aim to be um, simple, easy to do business with. Most importantly, um, do what we say we're gonna do um, and offer supply reliability and consistency. Um, here's a numbers view. Thought this was important um, as we talk about um, supply and demand today for structural softwood. Um, that left-hand side um, pie graph is the current product mix. Um, we sourced that from an industry dashboard. Um, that's the latest data up to last 12 months to April. Um, what's important here, because I'm sure this will come up today, um, really important to, to show that total um, sales about 3 million cubic metres per annum. 48% um, of that is in indoor structural, whether it's untreated or termite resistant. Um, and most importantly, only about 3% of total um, production has been sold as exports in the last 12 months, and all of that's low grade. Um, where does all this product go to? Well, it, it feeds into a total consumption um, for the Australian market of about four and a half million cubic metres. Um, and most of that um, goes into new detached housing and alterations and additions. Um, and um, then, as I've said, by the nature of customers, other non-residential, industrial, pallet packaging, et cetera. But you can see here, um, as we all know, alterations and additions and new detached housing is busy at the moment. Um, and um, that's where the majority of softwood goes. A bit more about our local industry. I think this is important and, and of course, very proud of this. Um, we represent probably 45,000 local timber jobs in Australia, um, where our economic benefit as a sector is estimated to be about 24 billion. Um, and most importantly, I guess, um, in context of the last 12 um, months, we um, think it's only reinforced the importance of having strong local manufacturing. Um, and um, obviously that's really poignant when it relates to building homes for Australian families. Now I just wanna jump into, I guess, what's on everyone's minds. And I think all of you are experiencing in the supply chain. And that's, um, well, needless to say, um, the, the government stimulus for housing's worked. 
Um, what I'm showing here is um, a whopping 32% increase in detached housing, which is the main driver for our product demand. Um, and it's increased um, 33,000 new detached homes for FY21. Um, having said that, it's the whole supply chain that's been impacted, not just timber. Um, and you can see that for FY22, that same rate of new detached housing is expected to hold for next year. So a very busy um, detached house construction market at the moment. How does that feed into how structural demand looks? Um, this is um, AKD's view of structural um, softwood demand. Um, we do in-house modelling of those detached housing. And again, you can see how it mimics the, um, the detached housing with the 30 odd percent lift in demand for FY21. Um, and again, we, we understand timber is getting a lot of focus at the moment because it's the first stage in the building cycle. Um, and we, we understand that, but the, um, the shortages and delays are affecting all building materials. Needless to say here, um, it, it's also problematic that we find a lot of our product demand is linked to a cyclical market. And as you um, might not appreciate, those cycles um, sit against a very long-term um, planning horizon for forestry and sawmilling companies where we look for 30 years um, timeframe. So that can be problematic in terms of dealing with um, cyclical demand. So I've covered off demand. Now I just wanna give you a view of how local supply has been reacting to that demand the last 12 months. I know the scale on this graph doesn't seem to show a lot of difference, but um, for year ending April 21, um, we put as a sector um, 300,000 more cube into this market in terms of stru structural softwood. Um, that's 15% up on the previous year. Um, but as I've shown, demand is roughly up 30%. So it's not enough to meet that demand. What this also shows is um, the green line, um, sorry, the, the blue line, which is um, the percentage of domestic supply, which is roughly 75 to 80% um, with the balance being imports. And of course, John will talk more about that today. Um, we're basically at capacity, but something that has impacted that recently um, and, and come to the fore only this month is the impact of bushfires, which I know everyone's been focused on as well. For us, um, that's meant the main impact has been for AKD's Tumut Mill in New South Wales and um, also Hine at their Tumbarumba Mill. I think it's really important to say um, that most of this year, um, both companies have been working really hard to process the bushfire impacted log. Um, that's now basically come to an end. And whilst we're both working really hard on getting extra log supply, um, we're still dealing with some of that uncertainty. The net result is probably um, a 30 to 40% um, change in log supply. Um, what AKD has done, um, and I can only talk more specifically to AKD, is that um, with our growth in our northern mill, we basically negated the impact of the tumor reduction. So you can see there the graph on the left-hand side. FY22, we're looking at really similar login volumes because we've ramped up our kabulcha mill and we'll continue to do that for FY23. And again, I know that... Um, both mills are being very flexible about um, log diet and where we draw logs from in terms of maintaining production. So that's an ongoing challenge, but also with some opportunities there. So when you put that view of demand and supply together, again, this is AKD's view of the world, um, we're showing a deficit in in supply of the order of seven to 10% of projected demand for the next two years. Um, and, and imports are playing their role and they're there. Um, can't do a perfect forecast, but based on um, recent volumes um, and imports is the orange one there, you can see that we're gonna have a gap 
um, to fill demand. And I'm sure I'm just putting a numbers view to what everyone on the webinar is feeling today. Um, most of those imports normally come from Europe in terms of structural softwood. And again, I'm sure um, John will talk more about that today and the challenges with that supply. But lucky us, um, and to the builders on the call today, I hope I'm, I'm claiming this correctly because we certainly find it. We don't deal direct with builders, but we still know builders want to build with timber. Um, so now I'd kind of like to move away from the problems and get into more of the solutions. Um, I think it's really important that you understand all the Australian producers are working hard and processing record numbers, as I've already shown here today. Um, we're also um, doing equitable planning of volumes. Um, and what do I mean by that? Um, we're trying to be really fair with doing, I guess, committed volumes to our regular customers. And we can't just respond to business and requests that are new customers and asking to three to four fold increases in volume. So we are working to those measures. Um, I think the other important thing um, to highlight here is that um, whilst we're um, dealing with this, what we're trying to do, and I think AKD is representing this today, we're just trying to keep up communications and also optimise what the high value cut at the sawmills is, which is obviously structural. Again, I'd reiterate timber framing is not the only building material that's facing these challenges, but because we're early in the cycle, certainly we understand the focus is on us at the moment. So as at today, um, Australian softwood sawmillers are close to capacity. The only reason I don't say capacity is certainly um, AKD Tumut and um, um, Hind Tumbarumba are dealing with that change in um, bushfire impacted log um, this month. Australian exporters, um, sorry, Australian sawmillers are only exporting undesirable low grade um, and it's it's really where there's not suitable markets in Australia for that same fall down product. We're also continuing to invest um, in a different sort of log diet and we're actually um, trialling smaller log. Um, that's often the export log. So we've heard, we know there's a lot of noise out there about how much log is being exported and we're certainly being flexible in our approach with that. As I've said, supply um, versus demand has to be managed and it has to be based around clear communication and not making false promises. Um, stick with timber, it is the best choice for the future. And I think the next um, webinar in two weeks time is really gonna help inform how we can be more flexible with design. And of course, we, we are using allocations to manage expectations. So that's the short term. Ongoing, we are continuing to invest and grow. So you can appreciate that um, getting every stick of structural timber out of our mills at the moment is certainly what our focus is and using every current technology um, at our disposal to do that. And it is a constant measure in all of our businesses. We also have um, new and updated softwood um, EPDs coming out shortly with an improved carbon footprint. Um, that's possible because of the new kiln drying technology that we're using. Um, this one is particularly po poignant to next, um, the next webinar. We, we have an opportunity to have um, design systems that use grades that aren't over-specified. So, um, there's a lot of safety factor in the current specification of grades, um, and we certainly want to work with the whole supply chain on how that can be wiser uh, and smarter over the coming years. We've also got a grade review um, process happening at the moment where we're looking at the assurance of timber product um, properties, um, and that's obviously to optimise current market access and potential new markets, and that's happening at the UniSA. Finally, we've got um, our timber framing campaign, um, and that'll kick off um, in the new financial year, talking about carbon benefits, and that will um, be for the whole supply chain and regardless of um, whether it's local or imported. Again, talking a bit more to the future, a smarter timber supply chain and ongoing collaboration, um, 
we just need to get um, a better view of supply and demand, and we need to keep having those numbers up on the page and, and trying to compare those. But more importantly, we need to not make promises that we don't know how to keep. So certainly AKD, um, we understand the stress and we understand the requests we're getting every day, but we're really trying to let the data drive our business, um, be respectful to those requests, but being clear about what we can and can't do. Um, coined the phrase here, seedling to installed structure. Again, how do we build better and quicker? Um, and we know that that's a challenge in, in the Australian construction um, supply chain. We also um, recognise here how we work with um, R&D investment by industry and supported by Forest Wood Products Australia, um, which looks at grade compliance, regulations, waste minimisation in our supply chain, and of course, afterlife for timber um, solutions. Supply security, we really think this is the reason that you know, structural timber, which in the past has been viewed as a commodity, is not just a commodity. So supply security is a value that we bring to any partnership that we're operating in, and we take that really seriously. And again, finally, the softwood sawmilling sector from the numbers that I've shown you today, you can see is really focused on supplying domestic demand. So our new normal, um, as we're all saying with COVID, but timber remains preferred. Um, we know, and I, I note the number of designers and architects on today's webinar, um, you guys know this better than I do. House designs are reflecting these changes, you know, home office space, multi-use spaces and indoor, outdoor living. And, and we wanna be part of that supply chain um, in the future. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna jump to the next slide. Um, Finally, your choice of structural material matters. Um, I'm here today, obviously, representing AKD. Um, we'd like that choice um, to be AKD first. We'd love it to be locally sourced plantation pine, but I think it's really important. We'd also prefer its timber over any other material from certified sources. And I think that's important because um, as you know, um, it takes very low embodied energy to produce timber. And then a typical Australian home stores about four tonnes of carbon dioxide in the frame that's, um, that you, is used in the home. So I think I've used my 15 minutes. Thank you for your time today. And especially um, to any customers um, who have tuned into today, a big thank you to you from AKD for your patience, your respect in how you're dealing with us. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, could you just click over the screen and uh, hand us over to Gavin? Gavin, please take over. All right. Thanks, uh, Christine. Uh, and uh, thanks, Sandra. And thanks, Wood Solutions. And uh, hello to everyone online. Um, I hopefully uh, uh, very similar uh, or connected uh, conversation to the one Christine just uh, uh, just presented, but um, I'll be concentrating on engineered wood products um, in Australia, and uh, I've got a little a bit of a byline there, but I think it's uh, it's very apt for this situation, weathering the perfect storm together. So uh, I'm Gavin Matthew, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Engineered Wood Products Association of Australasia, EWPAA, bit of a mouthful, but, um, and I'm um, recently in the role, but uh, had a long um, uh, history in, uh, in forestry and timber products in, in Australia and advocacy as well, you saw for my bio, but um, I'll just, let's move along. Hold on. Okay, so who are we? Uh, the Engineered uh, EWPAA is an industry technical association of EW producers uh, with a long history. We were formed in 1934, so we've been around a long time uh, but uh, uh, and been va adding value to industry for a long time as well. So we're based in Brisbane and we're, it's a small diverse business with a uh, NARDIS accredited test laboratory. Uh, we uh, undertake technical industry advocacy. We operate product and process certification schemes and we represent members on standards, codes, development and conduct collaborative R&D. And so we have a good understanding of, uh, of all, most of the, uh, all the processing plants are around Australia and, uh, and in New Zealand and, and elsewhere as well. But um, I'll, uh, 
I'll go quickly to what are EWPs. Um, EWPs uh, have consistent uh, properties and performance and a diverse building product used in both structural and non-structural applications. So, uh, and I'm sure most people uh, might know this, but uh, I think it was still useful to, to go through and really just uh, uh, show how diverse and uh, the types of products and how they fit together as well. So, so EWPs uh, include structural sawn timber and, and um, most say, well, is that an EWP? It, it, it actually is. So it's got known strength and stiffness and it's uh, established from uh, complex grading methods. So uh, it's certainly considered to be an engineered wood product. Um, laminated veneer lumber, uh, I'm sure uh, most people know that. Consistent properties used as a straight uh, structural element in buildings. Uh, medium density fiberboard, dense fiberboard used for inter uh, interior uses such as cabinets and doors, particle board, a wood panel for cupboards and flooring, uh, structural products as well, wood panel, uh, plywood, wood panel for bracing and cladding, again, it's a structural product, uh, glued laminated timber, a long span glued uh, finger jointed timber beams, uh, cross laminated timber, uh, new to Australia, but, uh, but been overseas for, for an amount of time and we're seeing it more and more in sort of mid rise uh, buildings. Uh, so very large plywood for prefab structural applications uh, is probably a good uh, description of it. Now, uh, additional products, wood composite products and systems with steel and plastic, uh, you know, timber can be used with, um, uh, with uh, pretty much anything and can come together and not just products, but also um, uh, building solutions, which, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later on as well. So the Australian uh, manufacturers, and I think this is a key point, you know, provide detailed product and application information to support the market and customers for each one of those, each one of the products that we produce in Australia. Now, I think it's also a, a shout out to Wood Solutions and you saw the amount of uh, detail and, uh, and guidance documents on Wood Solutions. It's a really good resource. So I'd certainly commend, commend you to, to, to access that. You saw it in Christine's um, uh, presentation, but EWPs uh, like sawn timber, uh, renewable store carbon have less embodied energy and environmental friendly choice. So I certainly think it's, a, it's the, the choice we, we should be making. Now, this might not be known by, by many people, but uh, EWP produces Australia. I've, I've done a bit of a bit of a map with, uh, with uh, the, the plants and some of those are combined plants or multiple plants on, uh, on co-located sites, but you can get a feel there for uh, LVL, plywood, particle board, GLT, CLT, some of those are uh, existing plants or, or plants that are, that are to come in the future. Um, you can see by the spatial um, sort of distribution that it's, uh, that it's certainly around. Uh, Australia, and that's that's no surprise as they uh, are close to the timber resource. So each each of these areas have a have a large timber resource as well. Uh, they're close to other processing like sawmills because they hang off uh, those kind of processes, and also near to uh, as near as possible to to key markets. But they do uh, EWPs do travel a bit more than obviously the uh, the primary product uh, log and those kind of primary uh, in furnishes for the process. So the perfect storm. Um, so I think it's, it's pretty obvious we have got a perfect storm at the moment. We have ongoing COVID-19 impacts, home builder, state stimulus, increased consumer spending on, on housing. I think uh, uh, you know, pretty obvious from low interest rates and no travel that the people are spending more, more money on housing. So it equals surging domestic uh, building activity and that's for detached uh, multi-res and alts and, and ads equals record building product uh, demand. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it was mentioned by Christine, but it's, it's for all building products, not just for timber products, uh, but we'll talk about uh, uh, timber products today. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the surge, surge in demand was unexpected by, by everyone. Uh, over a year ago, uh, building industries were expecting the exact opposite due to COVID and closed borders. Uh, so impacting migration and investment in new housing. So, so it's certainly been a, uh, an unexpected surge in demand and there remains an expectation of a correction. Um, and you can see from Christine's uh, graphs, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's gonna be hard to predict when that is and the size of it, but um, 
um, you know, the, uh, the fundamentals that underpin it of, uh, of border closures and, uh, and interest rates potentially going back up, uh, migration decreased, you know, those fundamentals still, still probably say that we're going to, to have a correction in the future and uh, and uh, might be a, a year or two two in the future and, and the scale it's very difficult to predict but uh, there will be a, a correction and we'll be having a, a different conversation at that stage so with record globing, uh, global building activity plus surging prices uh, in eu and us and i'll talk about that a little bit more later on international logistics and shipping challenges equals lower level of imports and uh, this particular particularly sort of uh, impactful in the WPA market. Now it, it equals, then equals delays in sourcing or, or building products, including timber products. Um, I, uh, uh, I did see an article in the New York Times titled, how the world ran out of everything. So it certainly is a global problem. And, uh, and as we say there, these delays will pass, but we all need to work together. All right. Um, what is happening supply? So domestic mills, very similar to, to Christine's story, but uh, domestic EWP uh, mills are running hard at capacity, at or near capacity, optimised product mix to focus on high demand products. Um, and this, the flip side of this indicates that, uh, that there may be delays in, uh, in accessing lower demand products as, as the focus is on the high demand products. Now efficient and targeted use of uh, timber products in, in buildings, more hybrid or old tech products uh, will emerge and are emerging. And uh, you'll see that, uh, I'm sure you'll see that in the seminar next week. And um, just example, there's a plywood box beam. Uh, efficiency improvements in supply chain logistics. Um, I thought it was very useful to talk about uh, uh, EW su uh, supplies made up of both domestic production and imports, some more, some less, depending on the product. So uh, if you look across to the right uh, there, LVL is, uh, is a classic of 70% uh, imports, 30% in domestic production. So it's very much influenced by how much imports we get into Australia. Uh, plywood's uh, a, similar, a similar type of product there with a high percentage of imports, lower, lower domestic production. Sawn timber from, as you saw from Christine's uh, presentation is, is different. It's uh, 75 to 80% domestic um, uh, produced. Particle board is also high domestic production as well. The point there is that uh, increases domestic production. So, you know, we could uh, continue to produce more and more, uh, but make less uh, impact on supply if the percentage of the importer supply is high. And that uh, you can see that in LVL. Now, where do, where do EWP uh, uh, imports come from? And uh, just a quick graph there, I won't talk to it too much, but. But uh, the key point is um, uh, that the strong EU and US markets are redirecting import volumes from these, uh, these places. And that's why we're, uh, we're seeing a, a shortage coming to Australia. So what's broadly happening in pricing trends? Um, all this is uh, publicly available information um, and the references are there, but uh, quickly go through it. So US timber product prices, and I'm sure that people have heard, uh, heard this, uh, lumber OSB plywood have surged in 2021, four to six times higher than in 2020. So just huge increases, obviously uh, uh, providing a, a much traction for, for people to, uh, to send lumber and uh, EWPs to, uh, to the US. So lumber pricing peaked in May 2021 and has uh, dropped significant uh, last month. So EU uh, timber prices uh, have surged as well. And uh, for Australia's situation, um, just briefly there, um, timber product prices have increased in Australia, uh, both domestic and imports due to the current uh, supply demand uh, balance. But I think the key point is that it's not as volatile or as big as those international price increases. Uh, the figures below for 12 months to March 2021 and the from the timber market survey, which, uh, which you can get, uh, get online. A couple of points there is that uh, um, uh, this, pricing that you see there uh, may not be everyone's experience. There is, there is a lag uh, in, the, in the reporting of that pricing and uh, prices have continued to increase since March. So uh, those prices have gone up again. We should note though that um, in, in Australia uh, and for many years, timber prices have not increased in real terms. 
which uh, has constrained uh, investment in uh, in uh, in facilities and those those things around Australia. So that's an important point to note. So future investments are being made. Innovative products continue to be developed to meet a, a strong and changing market. LVL systems, GLT, CLT, panel systems, hybrid products um, increase sort of penetration of these products into to multi-residential um, uh, developments, those kind of things. Uh, there will be uh, and there is an increased focus on building solutions, not just products. Uh, I think that's important. And uh, just to <clears throat> uh, put a uh, few new investments that are being made to increase domestic EWP uh, capacity in Australia uh, over the next few years. And you can see uh, you can see their detail down down there. Uh, announcements of a wood plastic composite plant uh, announced in SA uh, quite recently. Uh, GLT and CLT plant announced in South Australia as well. Uh, recently, a timber recycling facility for particle board announced uh, last year in New South Wales and getting up and going. So there's a lot of activity there. Um, and uh, it's quite exciting in, in terms of the EWPs. We certainly see it as a, a, you know, a strong future for them in Australia. Now, I've, 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 through this diagram, it looks a bit like a spaghetti diagram, but I think the point the important points I'm trying to make there is that it is a it, it's a connected and value adding supply chain, and it's a long supply chain as well for renewable wood fibre. So, so from left to right, you've got uh, the forests and the uh, the plantations. Uh, you've got the processing plants from sawmills, plywood mills, so primary breakdown uh, processing plants, particle board and MDF plants. Uh, you've got um, LVL and CLT glue land, which feed off these uh, these plants as well. And then obviously through to uh, truss and frame plants and joinery furniture, windows, doors, supplies into the, the building market. So, so <clears throat> a lot of value added along, uh, along that, that stretch and uh, obviously imported EWPs and other imports uh, uh, provide directly into that, uh, into the blue uh, column there. A couple of points there, I think are, are very useful is the wood fiber is the common key or renewable wood fiber that is uh, from now each tree um, is a different, uh, is different with different fiber and uh, will produce multiple products from saw and timber uh, to EWPs to panels or even paper products as well I haven't even put pulp and paper in in there but that feeds off it as well so so even within the same tree you're getting logs that are, that are, are useful for sawmills and also logs that will have, need to go directly into particle board plants or MDF plants or even pulp and paper plants as well so so uh, it's it's quite from there it, it uh, is quite um, uh, it's a natural product, so it's it's not uniform, uh, but uh, these processes here make it more and more uniform until it gets to the, uh, the actual uh, building market. Now, every operation is uh, is joined and uh, value added of the uh, fibre along the way. So that's, I think, an important thing to have a look at. Australia is all... Can you just wrap up in two minutes? You're just going a little bit over time. Yeah, 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 can do. Uh, I've got two more slides. So Australia needs to invest in for harvest trees. I'll let you read that, but basically um, uh, through bushfires and underinvestment and lack of government policy leadership, we need more trees. So we need to, to prime the pump at that left-hand end. Uh, and we can do that through uh, joint government commitment, incentivizing storage of carbon in new production trees, encourage farm forestry and remove red tape. So that's a really important, uh, uh, important part of it. Now with high demand putting pressure on Australian supply lines uh, change, it is a timely to reiterate that products supplied into the Australian construction market need to comply with Australian standards and be fit for purpose. So participants in the supply chain need to apply due diligence and question their supplies to avoid any non-conforming product being used. And this process can be uh, supported by quality product and process certification. Now there's summary points, I, I won't go back through them uh, again, but uh, important to talk to your supplier and uh, again, say uh, Wood Solutions is a really uh, useful place for, for information to underpin all these products. And thanks. Thank you, Gavin. So uh, I'd like to now introduce um, John Halkett. Over to you, John. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And can I, can I thank you uh, and thank Wood Solutions for putting on this webinar. Just uh, quickly, uh, the Australian Timber Importers Federation represents the importers and wholesalers that, that uh, collectively import about 85 to 90% by volume of the 
HS44 products that come into Australia. Uh, and as we've heard from the very good presentations from Christine and Gavin, we're at about 25% uh, of the structural product uh, consumption in Australia and increasing. Um, so I think that's an important point. I just wa also wanted to reinforce the last point that um, Gavin made uh, in relation to the current situation in Australia, notwithstanding the very good work that uh, Christine outlined in relation to domestic sawmills. We know that the bushfires, the 2019-2020 bushfires, um, savaged something like 40% of the domestic plantation resource. We also know that um, the establishment of new plantations has stalled in Australia over the last decade or so. And even if we followed Gavin's uh, uh, suggestion of 40,000 additional hectares of plantation in the ground today, we're 20 years away from having that resource available to the market. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm not clever enough to do a, a flash PowerPoint presentation. So I've got some notes here that I'm going to, to, to speak to. Um, the first point I really wanted to make, again, it's a point that's already been made, is that the, the stimulus associated with building and construction in Australia as a way of moving the economy beyond COVID has been replicated across the planet. So most countries in the OECD see building and construction as an important part of the response to COVID. So the sort of demand we're seeing in, in Australia is replicated elsewhere. And that's given, of course, rise to major problems on the supply side. Uh, so certainly um, uh, the, the cheap money that's available, the stimulus from governments uh, has, has affected uh, most countries and certainly the, um, the structural timber products are in really tight demand. Um, I think from an import point of view, we need to acknowledge that any product that comes into Australia must be compliant with the Australian building code, must comply with phytosanitary regulations and illegal logging requirements. And that's been a challenge in relation to some new sources of structural timber imports from parts of the Northern Hemisphere. One of the things that we have done as collectively as importers is to try and develop new sources of supply uh, for structural products that comply with the MGP-10 requirements. And, and that is, as I think Christine said, means sourcing product from the Northern Hemisphere, from the natural forests of North America and, and from Europe. We have been quite successful through companies like Canfor and Vida of sourcing significant amount of lodgepole pine, MGP-10, from Canada. That's been a real success um, in the last few years, and we'd expect that that momentum to, to continue in relation to Canada. Also, companies like Stora Enzo are bringing in significant amounts of Baltic pine uh, sourced from across Europe and processed through sawmills in Lithuania and the Czech Republic and imported into Australia, MGP 10 H2. So that, that's, that's certainly coming in. Uh, the, the reality though is that as, as we've heard, price increases um, are really volatile, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere. So for example, we've seen an increase in Europe of log prices to $160 Australian a cubic meter at roadside and these prices uh, which have more than doubled are likely to continue to increase so increased log prices mean increased uh, sawn out turn prices we've also um, we know that european sawmills uh, generally have a, a shutdown at about september and they are fully committed to supplying existing customers um, until that time Often they see Australia as quite a demanding customer because of our requirements around uh, legality, uh, phytosanitary and around compliance with, um, with building codes. 
for example, in Canada, um, we had to have spend $3 million on one sawmill to change the stamping system on the final product to ensure that the stamps that said MGP-10 on the requisite Australian standard were at 1.2 metre intervals on the face. And that was a, that's a requirement of the building code. And that was certainly a challenge for, um, for the Canadians. It's also, of course, uh, we all know that shipping um, and containers prices have gone uh, through the roof. Uh, there's now a three month wait in Europe for containers. Um, and the price of containers has climbed from around $1,800 US a container to Australia to $5,000 US. So shipping prices have climbed dramatically. That is, that is likely to continue. Port charges here in Australia between 2019 and 2021 have doubled. So we've got an increasing cost of shipping, increasing cost of containers, port charges, some work to rules around uh, Patrick terminals have not helped. And we'd expect these problems to continue for at least another 12 months. Availability of empty containers is a real problem um, around, around the planet, uh, particularly from, uh, from the Northern Hemisphere into Australia. So what can we do about this? There's no doubt that despite the best endeavors of companies like Hine and AKD, that we are going to see an increasing requirement for structural products, whether they be solid wood or whether they be of the engineered product that Gavin spoke about, we're going to see an increasing need to import that product at least for the next couple of decades. But there's no silver bullet here. There's no great resource of this product available to, to suddenly ship to Australia. And many importers, um, find that Australia market because the sizes are different to Europe and the demands around, around compliance are pretty tight. There's not a great enthusiasm um, for Australia, but notwithstanding that, ATIF has been talking to a number of prospective additional uh, Northern Hemisphere suppliers. We're also talking to federal ministers and to officials about mechanisms that may be considered to improve the prospects of increasing the volumes of timber imported um, from, uh, from the Northern Hemisphere. Those discussions have included countries like Sweden, uh, Lithuania, um, uh, Russia particularly, uh, and, and from Canada. Uh, we, we have identified with the federal government, given that their requirements are in relation to border issues, um, a number of challenges that relate to communications with, particularly with Russian uh, entities and trade associations. Um, and, and we are working to try and see whether we can't improve that situation. I think we're particularly interested in, in Russia, given that the volumes that have come directly from Russia into Australia have been relatively modest, although some of the Russian logs have come through Stora Enzo but directly from Russia, the volumes have been quite small. Russia has announced a ban on log exports from 2022, from next year. The anticipation is that a lot of that product will be processed domestically. That should provide an opportunity to increase the volumes of sawn product coming into Australia, both structural softwood and engineered products. So certainly um, we, we are talking to the Russians uh, we have asked the, the Minister, uh, uh, David Littleproud, to improve our capacity to liaise directly with Russian uh, government agencies and with entities. Um, and uh, we think that's, that's showing some prospects. We also think there's opportunities to harmonise some of the requirements um, around compliance with codes and standards and with, and with, um, with quarantine requirements and also address some of the issues around tariffs and non-tariff barriers. So we, we are certainly um, the importers in association with, with uh, freight and uh, customs entities in the middle of preparing a paper for federal government at their request that looks at this issue 
and make some suggestions about what might be done to improve the prospects of increased volumes of imported product, recognising the reality in terms of domestic supply in Australia. Now, that request um, has, uh, is, is well advanced. So my board, the Timber Importers Federation board, currently has a draft paper, uh, which is also being reviewed by freight and customs uh, um, entities. And that paper uh, is suggesting a two-step process uh, for the federal government. One is to have a round table of relevant uh, trade entities, whether they be uh, construction and, and building, uh, supply chain, um, government entities, uh, DFAT and, and agriculture. Um, so have a round table to, to try and scope out some of the areas where there might be some opportunities to, to improve the situation. And if that round table sh shows any real promise, the idea was to set up a working group to go through some of the issues in relation to better communications with prospective suppliers, re-examine issues around, uh, around standards and codes and regulatory requirements, um, and to also look at areas where we would be suggesting to forest and wood products that some work could be done on looking at grades, as Andrew said at the outset, um, to to make it somewhat, somewhat more attractive for countries to look at Australia as a supply destination. So we, we think collectively that's something which we are keen, keen to do. There's no doubt, as I, as I indicated, that in the next decade and beyond, given the situation in Australia with domestic supply, given the, the sort of demographics around uh, uh, in Australia, the, the, the changes we're now seeing in relation to housing approvals and build, building uh, additions and alterations that there is going to be a need for increased imports of timber products. Otherwise, we're all going to be living in steel houses. I think given the time, Andrew, I might just stop there and happy to take questions. Yep. I think, but firstly, while I'm doing that, uh, a question from Brooks to Christine. In light of the capacity constraint in what extent could you increase your production of structural timber in the next 12, 12 months versus the last 12 months? Well, the sectors increased that by 15%. Um, I would say we'll be doing um, our best to maintain that level for FY22. And, and that's in line with demand for 22 is going to be very similar to 21. But there's still going to be probably a gap um, of total supply meeting total demand. Thank you, Christine. Probably, uh, probably extension of this question is an anonymous question, and I'll, I'll um, ask uh, Gavin to answer it. <clears throat> is it understand the relationship between imports and domestic supply? But surely increasing domestic supply would safeguard the supply chain in the future. Is what's your comment on that, Gavin? Um, it's a good question, and uh, I uh, definitely feel that um, uh, the last this year and and uh, and the next year is 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 making that uh, resilience question and uh, increasing and fortifying uh, domestic production really really important to to Australia, but also the government, and uh, I think it also spans back into that that conversation I had around planting new trees, which underpins. Uh, production as well um, in Australia. So yeah, the answer is um, it, we, we need to really have that resilience conversation in Australia and uh, and try to do as much as we can uh, here. Thank you. And one for uh, John and Joseph. Uh, Baltic pine from Europe as a structural material did not have a good reputation in New Zealand. How is it comparable resolved in southern states in Australia? Good, thanks, Andrew. Certainly Baltic pine is a trade name. It combines spruce, pine, and some larix. Um, and all the product that comes in predominantly through store Enzo is all certified, machine graded, MGP 10. Some of it's H2 treated, some of it isn't. Certainly it, it complies with the quarantine and illegal logging requirements. And I think it's well received in, in the market here. Um, it's price competitive with domestically produced product. And uh, 
subject to log availability, which is a real constraint in Europe, we'd anticipate supplies of Baltic pine um, coming, uh, increasing. There's a couple of other countries uh, in Europe that we're talking to about, about similar lines of supply. And uh, I think generally frame and construction, um, frame and truss manufacturing companies I think are quite happy with the sort of Baltic pine as they are with the lodgepole pine coming from Canada. Okay, thank you, dear John. And okay, so we're running out of time for this uh, webinar, so I'll just uh, take the opportunity to wrap this up. Uh, and thank you, speakers, for your wonderful presentations. It's uh, it was a pleasure to hear from all that, and uh, you hit right to the point of the uh, topic. So the so just in closing, uh, just the questions again, and thank you to Morris who who answered the questions for you on the Q and A, uh, other than the very last uh, question. And I'm sure you know the answer to that one. But just a reminder, this, this presentation will be available from Wood Solutions in, in a week or so time. Just um, again, go to Wood Solutions website and, and Google for webinars and it'll, it'll come, up and come up there. Uh, the certificate will be emailed to all participants um, after, the, after today's presentation. Uh, and also include the three, three questions. Please download and fill in and keep for, keep for your own sake. Uh, there will be a questionnaire also, so please, uh, if you have time, Please fill out the question here. So I'd just like to remind you that the this is only one half of the uh, the, the webinar. The next the next webinar is in two weeks' time on the 20th of July, where we'll be talking about some of the solutions. And we have two excellent speakers in how Haywood and um, George Dollars talking about solutions that uh, which are a bit more out of the box uh, for this, this uh, for the interim period of time. So in this point in time, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you. It's now noon uh, and welcome and I'd like to see you at the next webinar or seminar and, uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.